super men. Super duper super men. Still your standard, all you stubble hoppers out there. Thank you again for tuning into Bert's Books, where today we are going to be fixing bayonets for a frontal assault on the German experience World War II pulp, as exemplified by this Leo Kessler's 1974 debut novel in the Wotan series. Before we proceed any further, may I draw your attention to the disclaimer below. I shouldn't have to point this out. I don't intend this channel, which I've set up as a pulp fiction shrine, to become a forum uh, for those shall we say eccentric historical opinions which tend to also float up with this subject matter so with that in mind i'm going to be turning off the comments below if we're all alice clar on that cover me ginger I'm going in. As the Second World War slowly receded from recent memory, literary accounts of wartime experiences gradually began to appear and were lapped up by an emergent audience eager for first-hand accounts of soldiers' experiences of these cataclysmic events. From the German side, a crop of authors channeled the war experience into fictional works with some convincing degree of authenticity. Concurrently with this, a garishly sensationalised regurgitation of the Second World War was also underway, courtesy of the Sweat Mags, a genre of men's adventure magazines which peddled highly embellished accounts of supposed wartime experiences. The public appetite for this kind of fiction, particularly among an English-speaking audience, uh, was sustained through to the 1970s, by which time the boundaries between authenticism and sensationalism had become decidedly blurred. Mass market Second World War titles were eagerly snapped up by British schoolboys, overgrown or otherwise, and certain authors of perhaps slightly murkier credentials began to dominate the market. Some of these pitched their protagonists as being in some way victims of the National Socialist system. Uh, Sven Hassel's characters, for instance, were written as convict soldiers doing punishment duties in a Wehrmacht penal regiment. However, one of the other more prominent, and probably the most prolific among these authors, Leo Kessler, instead appealed to his audience's more vicarious instincts, the Leibstandarte Regiment of the Waffen-SS, being the setting for his fictional mainstays. A former sergeant in a reconnaissance regiment during the Second World War, Charles Whiting had written professionally both fiction and non-fiction on and off since the 1950s. But during the 1970s, his literary career went into overdrive. He described his output as bang bang thrills and spells. Whiting's most successful alias was Leo Kessler, under which name he produced a vast number of World War II pulps, written as if from the German perspective, best known of which was the Wotan series, of which this book, published in 1974, was the first. Evidently planned from the start as a lengthy series, the SS Panzer Battalion opens with a publisher's note, which makes a bold claim that this novel is an adaptation of the recently unearthed memoirs of one Kuno von Doddenberg, a supposedly a Leibstandarte veteran whose background and wartime service is then broadly outlined. Born into a family of traditional cavalry officers, von Doddenberg found himself drawn to the SS during the 1930s, uh, enlisting first in a cavalry regiment and graduating from there to his father's disapproval to the Leibstandarte, in which he rises through the ranks and finds himself at the war's outbreak as a lieutenant in the Kampfgruppe Wotan, with whom he excels through subsequent campaigns. But the attritional nature of combat on the Eastern Theatre takes its toll, and by 1944 he's become sympathetic to the resistance against Hitler. This doesn't prevent von Donenberg from participating in the French and Dutch campaigns of that year with absolute recklessness, uh, before he's put out of action and captured by the Americans. From where he performs a post-war flit aided by the notorious Odessa Society, uh, getting as far as Italy, where his dwindling fortunes culminate in a failure of health, and in 1952, at only 34 years old, hegs out in the arms of his uh, Italian mistress. Uh, this somewhat flimsy claim to authenticity is followed by a translator's note, which painstakingly details uh, the correspondence of SS, Wehrmacht and British Army ranks, and makes great claims, uh, which is hardly a translator's job, to the military efficacy of this Wotan battle group. The credentials thus dispensed with, we're into the novel proper, in which a troop train has just disgorged 200 Lanzers to Eiffel. They snap briskly to attention in front of Lieutenant Schwartz and First Lieutenant von Dollenberg. As the troops form up for a marching song, we're introduced to Schultz.
thoughts as the company comedian. Even as the local peasantry gawp at these young blonde giants, the wisecracks and the low humour predictably begin to flow. Once installed in their new barracks, they're trundled out on parade, at which we can see von Donnenberg has one serious bonk on for the trappings and ceremony of the new Germany's elite guard. However, it's not really von Donnenberg's show, and he presents his troops to his superior officer, Captain Geyer, a new company commander of small, wiry stature, icy blue eyes, and a nose that's described as a monstrous abomination. And guess what? Geyer is German for vulture. <laughs> we quickly learn that Gaia the Vulture is a dangerously unscrupulous officer who's prone to vaulting ambition. He makes it abundantly clear that he aims to attain the rank of general on the backs of the utterly disposable men beneath him, of whom he expects nothing but 100% devotion. We are whisked from here to the hands-off Cox Reve call from a duty NCO who mercilessly hustles his men through the washroom onto PT parade for the start of a brutal regime of training. And here we learn that we're in the company of Sergeant Major Metzger, butcher by name, butcher by inclination. The coincidence of names to personal attributes in Kessler's books is a frequent cliché, and we quickly learn that Metzger is the epitome of the bully boy NCO that we frequently encounter in Pulp War titles. A loudmouth of limited personal intellect, a braggart, and behind it all, somewhat deficient in his own martial prowess. Metzger harangues his men through a gruelling succession of exercises, at the end of which their rest period is interrupted by the sallow little officer that is Lieutenant Schwartz, who then insists on lining the men up and performing a particular party trick that has long since been dismissed as a popular myth concerning German World War II training, namely the balancing of a captured British Mills grenade on the top of one Stahlhelm, the explosive blast supposedly being deflected by by the helmet's crown and rim in a destructive circle that leaves the wearer, if he's standing perfectly still, unharmed. Schwartz performs this unlikely sounding feat himself. Just as he's about to line the men up to replicate this stunt, he's pulled up by von Doddenberg, who berates the junior officer for involving the men in this dangerous stunt. <laughs> Schwartz icily reminds von Doddenberg that his uncle is none other than Reinhard Heydrich himself. It's a fairly frequent characteristic of these kind of books to try and write the big personalities into the narrative. Donenberg, however, is having none of that and informs Schwartz that he's a nasty little garden dwarf. <laughs> I don't know if these kind of weirdly invented put-downs are a common linguistic trait in Germany, but these books are littered with them. Having made himself a potentially rather dangerous enemy here, Donenberg does concede that you can't mollycoddle the men, and embarks on his own programme of sorting the men from the boys. In this case, by lining them up in front of a borrowed Mark I panzer, and allowing them 15 minutes to hack out a foxhole before the contraption is set to come rattling over their heads. This exercise results in no serious casualties, other than two men fainted, and one soiling his britches. That evening, von Donenberg calls Schultz at his quarters and quizzes him about how such an unlikely candidate as himself has ended up in this particular Praetorian guard. There's some wisecracking cock and bull about Schulter trying to uh, impress some girl from which he reveals himself to be a virtual splice of both Porter and Tiny from the Sven Hassel books. This isn't enough to put the lieutenant off from appointing Schulter to the position of his general dog's body once the action starts. Unfortunately, Schulzer has also drawn the attention of Sergeant Major Metzger, who has the hamburger down as a troublemaker. So it's doubly galling for, for Metzger to then witness Schulzer scoring so highly on the target range that his own regimental shooting record is threatened. Metzger sabotages Schulzer's chances, for which Schulzer vows revenge. A week later, he cries off from a high-profile parade with a sick note and lands himself with light duties, which involves beating Mrs. Metzger's carpets in the married men's quarters. Laura Metzger is a voluptuous, bored and neglected NCO's wife and Schulzer doesn't have to try too hard to get her into the bedroom for a rather malicious revenge bang. That same evening, Schwartz is treated to an evening out with his notorious uncle, an excessively boozy affair that culminates in a drunken Heydrich discharging his pistol at his own reflection in the hotel mirror before revealing to his astonished nephew that he, and therefore Schwartz by extension, is of partly Jewish descent. A footnote here, 
mentions that Heydrich was in retrospect probably mistaken on this account. The approach of springtime and the continued Sitzkrieg situation in Western Europe sees an intensification in the men's combat training. Gaia, meanwhile, is harbouring devious thoughts towards the battalion's de facto commander, a Major Hartman, who's conspicuous by his absence from this actual storyline. As the prospect of genuine combat experience looms larger, Gaia announces that the officer's carder will be treating the men to a Kameradschaftsabend, an evening of military piss artistry for which we joined the Votan officer corps for a pre-event briefing in which Gaia and Schwartz eye each other with mutual contempt. After a formal slug of schnapps they head over to the canteen and as the evening gets underway we're made privy to Gaia's inner thoughts namely that he's more stimulated by the company of these fit young men than he'd care to publicly admit. Quickly pushing such thoughts to the back of his mind he bids the company wit to entertain the crowd with a joke. Are you ready for this? What did the soldier say to his wife after he had come home on leave for the first time in six months. Take a good look at the floor, darling, because you're only going to be seeing the ceiling for the next 48 hours. <laughs> Many drinks later, the conversation and the quality of humour has degenerated even from this level. One by one, the company's officers take their leave. We follow von Doddenberg's progress at first, he somehow meandered drunkenly into town where he randomly hooks up with some obliging mystery blonde for a no-ties blackout bunk-up. Next, we join Schwartz, who's somehow been drawn towards an empty synagogue where he drunkenly bellows his rage at the trick that he believes fate has pulled on him. Gaia, in the meantime, is alone in his quarters, leafing through his private collection of male nudes, uh, while his antique clock ticks away the minutes of his life. An interesting literary touch that he's not fated to die in this nor in the subsequent couple of books. The next chapter opens with the news that they're shortly to march and while Gaia is initially coy about the details it transpires that they're bound for a faint into the Low Countries in a bid to draw the Allied forces away from France's defence. In the frenzy of preparations that follows Metzger is suddenly plagued by the telltale signs of a dose of the clap. <laughs> Figuring it wouldn't be a good thing to report it to the MO this close to action stations, he opts for the town quack instead, who deals with the matter in the old-fashioned way with a specialised catheter known as the umbrella. Limping out from surgery, Metzger is surprised to encounter Schulze, who's also in line for the same medicine, and informs the inquisitive but slow sergeant that he's experiencing marital problems, and slopes in, reflecting that poor old Laura will be in for the worst hiding of her life. That is some pretty fucked up revenge there. I'm, I'm not clear if he knew he was infected when he went to beat Laura's carpets. Twelve hours later, it's time to move, and Gaia informs the men that their objective is the Belgian fortress of Eben Emal, a virtually impregnable redoubt and which guards the confluence of the Meuse and the Albert Canal, where they're to link up with a troop of paratroopers who are to land by glider on top of the fort to complete the objective of reducing this obstacle. Part two begins with the company on a frontier road, where Gaia appears to inform them that the paratroopers have landed on the fortress, but not in the numbers expected, and now it is up to Votan to push on to complete this mission. To this end, Gaia press gangs the crew of a nearby Mark IV Panzer to act as his personal mount, and leads the rest of the company in their motor transport towards the action, slashing at the tank commander's face with his cane <laughs> when the vehicle pauses behind some horse-drawn artillery, forcing the tank to plunge straight into this column at speed. Gaia then forces the crew to proceed into what's a very likely spot for an ambush, jumping off to join von Doddenberg in his Kubelwagen uh, in time to see the Mark IV erupt into a fireball. Just as I thought, he comments to an incredulous von Doddenberg before outlining his plan for for a pincer movement to take the fortified village that lies in front of them. As further Votan vehicles begin to go up in smoke, the surviving men slog it out on foot, exchanging small arms fire with Belgian troops. As they gather in the village to plot their next move, the river crossing, only Gaia, who's prodding a captured Dutch customs man for information, seems immune to the symptoms of combat shock. His prisoner cooperates in revealing the opposing positions across the Meuse, and Schwartz points out that there's a handy batch of ferry boats uh, in 
inexplicably left intact downstream, which they can make use of, before further pointing out to von Doddenberg's consternation that the Belgian squad overlooking that position might be slightly less eager to open fire if Wotan were accompanied by some civilian hostages. Overruling von Doddenberg's objections, Schwarz and company herd a group of terrified civilians into a boat and they then propelled over the river into the Belgian firing line, clusters of Wotan men slipping into the water behind them. Von Donnenberg, despite himself, has become an active party in this tactic, urging the human shield forward until one of the Dutchmen bellows at the hesitant Belgian troops on the other side to open fire. By now though, they've reached the bank and the Wotan men are able to take on the Belgian position without too many further casualties. Gaia showers his congratulations around, but advises that due to that unfortunate business back there, uh, i.e. the dead civilians floating in the water, iron crosses are probably out of the question. Their next objective is the village of Cannes, which they plan to do as a pincer, von Donomo from the north and Schwarz from the south. The former is obstructed by a troop of frontier cyclists, who his company deal with in a matter of minutes, but elsewhere Schwarz has run into difficulties and finds himself separated from his men with a head wound pinned down by Belgian machine gun fire in a farmyard Kazi. Fortunately, he's able to call down a strike from some circling Stukas and pelts for the relative cover of the village church, where he's confronted by an unfamiliar man who identifies himself as Weissfisch, a German Jewish refugee whose sense of self-preservation undergoes a fatal breakdown as he queries whether Schwarz and himself have met before and goes on to conjecture that Schwarz himself exhibits distinctly Jewish features despite what the footnote uh, of the previous chapter informs us of the reality of the Heydrich family history. This provokes Schwarz into a homicidal frenzy which leaves Weissfisch throttled on the church floor. Von Doddenberg's men arrive on the scene to find Schwarz in a weirdly calm state with a faraway look in his eyes. Von Doddenberg is looking at Schwarz very curiously, as if he's beginning to suspect that the latter is, in fact, deeply unhinged. It's common with this type of fiction that the National Socialist regime's egregious characteristics tend to be distilled into one or two particular characters. Schwarz, in this case, is, is clearly its carnal representation in the pages of these books, but there's little time to dwell on this right at this point, because Gaia is just bowled triumphantly up to inform the men that the mysterious Major Hartman, who we've still never met, is now out of action, and that the Vulture himself is now Votan's de facto leader, and they're off to their next objective, Eben Amal itself. Observing this impressive fortress from a forward position, von Doddenberg is astonished to hear the vulture express relief that the paratroopers have so far failed to take their objective. In the delay till zero hour, Sergeant Metzger, who's failed to cover himself with glory during the campaign so far, is dejectedly kicking around the village, clearly pissed off that von Doddenberg has slated him for suspected cowardice. He's interrupted from his vengeful ruminations by the appearance of a girl who's clearly the village simpleton who makes a crude invitation to him for sexual intercourse. The butcher doesn't think twice, least of all about the dose of the clap that he's still carrying around with him, and we're treated to a distinctly unappetising sex scene. You'll find a lot of those in Kessler books, which is mercifully cut short by the appearance of von Donnenberg and Schulze. Incensed, von Donnenberg dishes out a vicious barracking, demoting the butcher to the ranks on the spot and assigning him to punishment duties on the flamethrower. As night time falls, they're slipping across the canal to make a troubled progress towards the fortress, fighting their way through Belgian pickets and a minefield, before linking up with the paratroopers, who are holed up among the bunkers that they've put out of operation at the top of the fort. A para-sergeant informs von Doddenberg that they've failed to penetrate the galleries. The Votan men now assume the initiative, and following a spectacular stunt in which von Doddenberg shins down the front of the fortification, blasts open a gun emplacement with a batter of grenades, and followed by his men infiltrates the galleries. Von Doddenberg and his men succeed in overpowering and forcing the surrender of a section of the complex, a traumatising experience in the course of which Schwarz confirms von Doddenberg's suspicions that he's irretrievably batshit. While they're almost foiled by a Belgian counter-attack, the Votan men win through, are joined by a jubilant guy who straps on Metzger's flamethrower to press home a further decisive onslaught on the Belgian defenders. 
By this point, von Donnenberg has sustained a shoulder wound, which shorts her endeavours to plug up. A malingering Metzger, meanwhile, conscious that a court-martial is probably looming, makes an exploratory foray into the pockets of Gaia's discarded tunic, discovers to his astonishment a crumpled example of the Vulture's clandestine dirty picture collection. <laughs> Metzger pockets the item, realising for, for all his limited intelligence that this is his ticket out of trouble. Schultzer, meanwhile, chooses this spot of post-combat downtime to reveal to von Donnenberg that he himself has experienced firsthand the brutal kind of treatment that the National Socialist regime is dishing out to those that they consider as undesirables. Von Donnenberg reveals himself to be almost willfully naive about the matter, his incredulous comments being countered by Schultzer's angry assertion that his torturer had, in fact, been wearing the same uniform as themselves. Impossible, Brie von Donnenberg before Gaia calls them to a final charge on the few remaining Belgians. The last pockets of resistance now being mopped up and the fortress completely in German hands. The Sixth Army begins to traverse the canal while the remaining men of Wotan form up into column and march off in parade ground order. The afterword finds various Wotan survivors recovering to a background of military triumphalism as the Wehrmacht's Western Campaign continues across Europe unimpeded. At a celebration in the Heidelberg Hospital in which they're recovering, Metzger picks his moment to pull his blackmail act on Gaia, successfully re-establishing himself to his former rank thanks to the indiscreet photo. Schultzer, meanwhile, uh, is keeping a running score of the nurses he's managing to bang, but such distractions have to go on hold when they're summoned to a special parade, where none other than the jumped-up corporal himself takes the parade, showering words of praise and shedding a crocodile tear for the fallen men of Wotan's 1940 campaign. We close out with a new draft of recruits, greeted by the now Major Gaia, who's evidently over the moon with the shiny knight's cross which adorns his neck and dispenses his usual pleasantries regarding unquestioning obedience, while von Donnenberg, apparently not having taken in the lessons he's received during that recent campaign concerning the nature of the organisation he's involved with, nurses a renewed bonk on for the coming dawn of the new order. And so that's this, the first in what would become a long series of novels concerning the wartime antics of this core group of characters. A series of books which seemed increasingly churned out as they went on. While an English-speaking readership has long hoped for a World War II equivalent to remarks all quiet on the Western Front, very few people could confuse a pulp like this with such a thing. But still, a cursory look at Charles White credentials tells us that he was neither unqualified to be writing on this subject area nor was he a dummy. There are a couple of passages that do veer towards a somewhat convincing combat, ve combat veteran type account summoning up the adrenaline charged cocktail of fear, fatigue and thousand yard stare combat madness that's not entirely unconvincing. However for the large part the Kessler depiction of Waffen SS life is weirdly redolent of the kind of pop culture regurgitation you'd find within British comic books of this period. The idea of such men swanking around the battlefield in their black uniforms with a riding crop and lording it over their Wehrmacht equivalents, it seems rather the stuff of Hellman of the Hammer Force. This would be less jarring but for the rather curious claim to authenticity that this book opens up with. A, a ruse that probably wouldn't have rubbed on the adult readership, but to the adolescent audience, high on the whiff of humbrol paints and airfix glue, it would maybe have been less transparent. One of my main beefs with this book, however, is pure trade description. It calls itself SS Panzer Battalion. You've promised us Panzers, Whiting. Where's the cocking Panzers? <laughs> there are two. There are two in this book, and they're both borrowed. Uh, although, like Sven Hassel, the Panzer designation is written in and out of the narrative throughout this series, depending on the plotline demands. Uh, secondly, there's an element of misappropriated glory to some of this. I've not been able to find a single account of the attack on Eben ML that mentions Waffen SS involvement. The credit for this feat generally being attributed to the Fallschirmjäger paratroopers instead. While Whiting's books catered to a dubious kind of mass fetishisation of the Waffen SS, it's worth noting that the author turned in Second World War fiction, written from a variety of differing viewpoints, and so it doesn't necessarily follow that he'd have had any particular particular bias in favour of this organisation. Pulp has a way of pitching to its audience's voyeuristic impulses and these books were highly successful on that score. 
In its defence, this book is probably one of the better written efforts in this series, and the author did at least choose to focus on a comparatively obscure campaign, and he does seem to have done his research here, and he does make some effort to delineate his characters uh, one-dimensional as the characters are, their various motivations and personality quirks in this story. A frequently made defence for this type of fiction is that it, these books serve as popularisers of World War II literature. In other words, you pick these up at an age when your tastes aren't terribly developed, <laughs> you lap them up for a couple of years uh, before you move on to more serious and historically reliable works. So these books remain as somewhat grubby artefacts from an age of, of unapologetically lowbrow combat lit tracts that aren't really a complete meal in themselves, but they're fairly serviceable as rain bypassing combat lit pulps. They're significantly slimmer volumes than anything Sven Hassel ever churned out, meaning you can zip through one of these in the space of a short to medium train journey or a prolonged spell on the regimental thunder boxes after a dodgy batch from the field catering unit. <coughs> Get him outside. Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? 